Hello, this is uh, Bishop Frank Brookhart again, and welcome to the second in our series of uh, sessions looking at uh, stories associated with Lent from scriptures and uh, linking those with some famous paintings. The idea here, of course, is that the painters are interpreters of these scriptural stories. And um, that allows us to uh, approach these stories through our eyes rather than through our ears. Uh, rather than hearing it read, we can see it. This morning, we'll be looking at the story of the cleansing of the temple. It's the gospel appointed for the third Sunday in Lent. And we'll, in, in a second, post the painting and I will read the story uh, from uh, the Bible using the Common English Bible translation. I'll tell you a little about the background of the story. Um, it's rather complicated. And I'll tell you a little about the artist and the uh, painting uh, per se, and then I'll be quiet for a while and allow you to look around at the painting. And as I said last time, remember, you don't have to be some sort of expert uh, to enjoy uh, good paintings. Um, simply let your eyes wander around the painting, uh, see what interests you, what draws your attention, what is fascinating, um, and then at some point draw back and try to take the whole picture in. And uh, then at the end, we'll discuss together uh, what the what the painting might mean, at least from my point of view. Although I'm I'm uh, not an authority, I'm a lover of art, an amateur in that sense. Um, but we'll do this together. So why don't we begin? At this point, let's bring up the painting. There it is. This is the. Uh, painting entitled Expulsion from the Temple. Uh, it is by a Renaissance artist named Giotto di Bondoni, usually known simply as Giotto. That's G-I-O-T-T-O. -T -T he died in 1337. He's really one of the great artists of all times. Um, this particular painting was done somewhere between 1304 and 1306. Uh, Giotto uh, really changed the whole direction of art. Prior to this time, painting had been uh, based on icons from, from, the, uh, from the East. Uh, they, they are uh, formalized, uh, static, flat, uh, paintings, uh, usually done according to a series of conventions. Now, that's not to put them down. I think icons are marvelous. Uh, but Giotto introduced a whole new element. One is that it's dramatic. His pictures are like a snapshot of a scene from the Bible. I mean, it's clear he has imagined his way into this scene. Secondly, uh, the, the figures and the buildings and the like all have a sort of uh, uh, weight or body to them. Uh, they're not flat. You'll notice that they, they have a roundness and a kind of realistic look to them. And Giotto also, by architectural features in the background of many of his paintings, suggests perspective. Now, perspective hadn't been uh, developed at this point. That would come later with Brunelleschi and some others. But Giotto begins to point in that direction. This, uh, this is a fresco, uh, which is a special type of painting. The artist would smear wet cement or wet plaster on a wall and then paint into the plaster. Uh, you can sense that you'd have to work very accurately and very quickly for this to take place. And the paint then, when it dries, becomes really part of the wall. Um, and uh, unless the plaster is damaged 
And this, this paint does have some damage on it, but it, unless it's uh, damaged, it really is there for a long time. It's about a, a meter by a meter. It is on the wall of a church. Uh, it's called the Cro uh, Scrovegni Chapel in Padua in Italy. It's a little church that uh, the, the Scrovegni family put up in atonement for the sins of a grandfather. And the whole place is just covered with these wonderful uh, frescoes by Giotto. This is rather a large painting. It's a, about a meter by a meter. Um, and, and, and you can uh, sense the color, even though the, the thing is uh, quite old. Let me read the story to you from John's Gospel. This is John chapter 2. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were sell selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency, sitting there. And he made a whip from ropes and chased them out of the temple, including the sheep and the cattle. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who were exchanging currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it, take, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Uh, the Jewish people in Jesus' time were required to go to Jerusalem three times a year to worship in the great temple. This is the second great temple that uh, Herod the Great had constructed. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Um, they were required to go and three times a year. And uh, as prescribed in, in the law, they were to offer sacrifices um, as a sign of thanksgiving and also as a way to make atonement for um, sins. And uh, what you were to offer depended on your level of, of wealth. Uh, rich people might be asked to give a, a, a cow. Poor people were allowed to offer and sacrifice a dove. So the people go there, uh, massive crowds of people. Uh, there were people around the temple who exchanged the money. And this is one of the problems with, uh, with uh, that the story identifies. The money that the people would have brought would of course been Roman or Greek coins. And their coins like ours today had images of leaders on them. This of course is contrary to Jewish law. No images allowed based on the Ten Commandments. Uh, so in order to buy uh, purified, ritually pure, sacrificial animals, they had to exchange the money, Roman and Greek money, for coins especially minted for use in the temple. And they would buy then from temple authorities with these uh, coins that had no images on them. They're, they're sacrificial animals. Now, as you can sense, there was some money making going on here. Uh, then as now to exchange money normally requires a fee. And the beneficiaries of the fee sometimes were the money changers, but also sometimes the temple authorities. So, uh, what had uh, been built as a place to uh, glorify God and to draw people to God and allow people to um, 
be the people of God, according to the covenant, had become a place of business, a place where animals were sold and profits made. And uh, it's a sign that things had become corrupt at the temple. Things were not the way they should have been. What was supposed to be a house of prayer was becoming a house of merchandisers. So in the story, Jesus uh, makes a whip, if you can believe that, and scatters the people and the animals. And uh, the disciples remember an Old Testament quote, uh, zeal for your house has consumed me. Well, in John's gospel, this also becomes a symbol, a theological story, uh, where Jesus is talking about himself as the temple. And the part of the point of the story is that the new temple, the new true temple, the new true place where you met God would be Jesus. And the old temple uh, was not adequate. As, as uh, history would have it, and early Christians took this as a sign from God, uh, this second great temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman army under General Titus. And it has not been replaced to this day. The site of it is there, but not the temple itself. So John is saying that Jesus is the true temple, the true place where we meet God. Well, let me be quiet for a minute and allow you to uh, look at the picture on your own terms. Well, let's begin with the background. You'll notice that uh, Jato has constructed a, a, a building there. Uh, let me assure you, that's not what the temple in Jerusalem looked like. Uh, this looks like a church to me. Does it to you? You can see uh, that it has three porches and three entries into it. Uh, over on the right, looks like what might be an outdoor pulpit. Those were common features in, in uh, medieval churches. Uh, our cathedral here in Los Angeles has an outdoor pulpit on it where, people, where you could preach to the crowds. Notice that uh, there are symbols on the porch, some lambs and some... Uh, medallions that are called uh, roses, messianic roses, roses of Sharon. I think those are intended probably to uh, suggest that, that again, um, that the true temple, the true place where we meet God is the one who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as the first chapter of John's gospel calls Jesus. Well, that middle porch frames Jesus, who is, of course, the center of attention here. Look at this. Do you see uh, he uh, appears to be about ready to slug the, the money changer, doesn't he? Look at the expression on his face. And he's wrapped in that robe. Um, 
that gives him a good deal of substance. You notice he's the biggest figure of all in the, in the painting. A halo, of course. What else do you see about Jesus? What would you call that expression on his face? Well, the two figures to our right or on Jesus' left are money changers. The, the one nearest to Jesus looks to me like he's about ready to leave, putting up his hand to defend himself. The, the, further, the one further on, uh, I'm not so sure. What, what do you make of those hands? What's he doing with his, what, what does that, what do his hands suggest to me? And look on his face. Looks like he might be angry. Beyond the two money changers, we, we see some uh, um, older gentlemen with long beards whispering to each other, talking to each other. I think those are probably the religious leaders, the ones who will pose uh, questions to Jesus. You know, who do you think you are? Why are you doing this? You will see the cage there at the bottom for birds. And there's the table that's been turned over. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but uh, uh, the, the sheep, the goats actually there are jumping out of a little cage. As with a lot of these uh, medieval and Renaissance painters, they had a real fascination with the animals. The goat, the goat almost has a personality, doesn't he? On the left-hand side of the painting, we have um, uh, apostles. The one uh, closest to Jesus, uh, I suspect, is supposed to be Peter. That I'm just saying that based on traditional images of, of Peter as a somewhat older man with white beard. What do you make of his hands? You'll notice there on the, on the far left that one of the apostles is bent over and you have to look a little bit, but you'll see he's, he's uh, hugging a child. And, and there's another child uh, right in front of uh, Peter. You know, uh, what do we say here? Jesus is scaring the kids. Then we have some animals Sheep, I think, in this case, walking off. They're on the escape, too. And uh, look at the apostles <clears throat> behind. There are three faces there. What do those facial expressions seem to mean to you? Well, you can sense <clears throat> that that uh, uh, this is an action scene, uh, and that, that raised arm of Jesus is is uh, very dramatic, isn't it? Um, it's like a snapshot of a moment in the cleansing of the temple. We have the apostles looking on, remembering, thinking. They're the ones who will later on tell us about this story. They're the rememberers of the, of the event. Man and beast, divine and human, heaven and earth, What happens when what is supposed to be uh, sacred, spiritual, what happens when that becomes corrupt? 
What might Jesus say about that? This has always been a problem <clears throat> in the history of the church. You can study church history in terms of, of uh, moments of reform when uh, people um, decided that something had to change. First one of those, of course, was in the fourth century with the rise of, of uh, monasticism. The church had become lukewarm happened again a couple of times in the Middle Ages. We think of the Protestant Reformation. What about today? Can you think of the church being reformed today? What about the decline of mainline or old line churches like ours? What's that about? We're about ready, I think, to see the decline of um, the so-called evangelical churches. Evangelical is a good word. Uh, they've co-opted a good word. Evangelical just means according to the gospel. And in this Lenten time, what in us would Jesus cleanse? What in us? What in St. James' congregation? What does it say to you that Jesus has a zeal for holiness? He has uh, a zeal for things being according to the will of God. It's a fascinating picture, isn't it? I have to say that I find it a little scary. What about you? Well, I think that's enough for today. Thank you for tuning in. More to come. Uh, pictures of... Uh, of the crucifixion and the resurrection, and I believe also the raising of Lazarus. Um, see you next time. Blessings and peace to you.